Good afternoon, and welcome to True Crime Mysteries. If you are new to the channel, hello and welcome, and if you are returning, welcome back. Today, we are discussing four more hired hitman fails. You guys really like these videos, and so do I. But first, this is your friendly reminder to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so you know when I post. But with that being said, let's get into it. June Picard and Francis Noble Rita Mansour had been happily married to her husband for three years. Rita, 31, and her husband, 32-year-old Francis Noble, were even talking of expanding their family and having kids. When she and Francis married, he had moved into her condo in El Cajon, California. Unexpectedly, his mother had also followed him in the move. Rita didn't exactly get along with her mother-in-law, but had tried to make it work the best she could for the sake of her marriage. She and Francis had been planning a cruise to get away and maybe start trying for their first child, and she had been excited about the trip. She had been shocked when, while she was getting in her car to go to work on January 12, 2012, she said she was intercepted by two detectives. She didn't believe what the detectives were saying. They spent several hours convincing her that there was a hit placed on her by her husband and mother-in-law. She wouldn't believe them until she was shown video evidence. The investigation had started only days before, on January 7th, when the El Cajon Police Department received a call from a concerned citizen. An old classmate of Nobles had bumped into Picard at the mall. The two started conversing, and the conversation turned sour pretty quickly. He said that Picard had asked him to assist her in killing her daughter-in-law. The man said he would help Picard, but instead he called the police and agreed to assist them instead. The man helped connect Picard to a hitman, who was in fact an undercover police officer, and the officer quickly set up the first meeting. Picard and Noble met the officer in the Parkway Plaza Mall, where they discussed what they wanted to be done. I'm sure. I'm sorry, we're having me on her. We want to get rid of her. I mean, the one is dead. She's healthy and American, bless her little heart. She's sitting on $80,000 in her savings account. If we tried to strangle the trooper, we'd have our handprints all over her. We was originally thinking maybe something in the radiator and maybe something blow up. All we just need is that one DNA card back. The rest of them, take them, mm -hmm. run them out to the max. We've already figured a story to keep her parents at bay for a while. In addition to the $80,000 in Rita's bank account, they also had hoped to gain her condo, as well as a $100,000 life insurance policy. Noble paid the officer $100 as a down payment and promised to get the rest as soon as possible. They agreed to meet again on January 12th for another part of the payment. Detectives instead secured the safety of Rita first, just in case they weren't the only ones with a contract to hurt the victim. Once she was safely at the police station, they went to meet again with Picard and Noble who were then arrested. They were charged with conspiracy to commit murder and soliciting murder. Initially, they both pleaded not guilty, but soon changed pleas when it was revealed how much evidence was against them. They were both sentenced to life in prison, which in California is 20 years with the possibility of parole. During the sentencing, neither showed any signs of remorse. They were eligible for parole in 2019 but it appears they are both still in prison. Swift action in these kinds of cases saves lives. Lieutenant Steve Schakowsky said in a statement, this is not the type of investigation that you can let simmer for a long period of time because there is a danger factor involved. Deputy District Attorney James Romo applauded the El Cajon police for a perfectly executed takedown of two potentially dangerous people. Wendy Lynn Ween. It was the summer of 2020 when the Michigan State Police got a peculiar call. A man, Bob Innes, ran a parody website called Rent a Hitman, and since its inception, he has gone through the process of reporting people who reached out to him via the website looking to hire a hitman. Yeah, so I brought some show and tell. 
In a quiet park in Fairfield. Nevada Police Department. Cases from Indonesia. Wearing dark sunglasses to partially protect his identity. There's some emails that she had submitted. Bob Innes showed us his pages and pages of printed out emails. This is just a lot of uh, solicitations from people around the world. Innes has been getting these messages for over a decade from all sorts of people so hoping for through. some help. How do you describe yourself? Cyber Crusader <laughs> is, uh, yeah. Um, and I'm the webmaster of uh, rentahitman.com, your point and click solution. Yes, Innes runs rentahitman.com, a website he launched in 2005 when he started an IT business. And it was a play on words rent as in hire us, hit as in web hit, visitor, traffic, analytics, that kind of thing. The business soon fizzled, but the site took on a life of its own. When Innes checked the email attached to the website a few years later, he had hundreds of unread messages with several dark requests. What is the best? way to handle it. It's scary because they walk among us. I mean, I've had cases out of Lake County and Stockton and L.A. I'm working on a case right now with the L.A. County Sheriff's Department. Really makes you wonder about who's out there. Are they your neighbors? Are they your business associates? You never know. Innes said that on July 17th, 2020, a woman had reached out to him after filling out a service request form from the site. Initially, she had used a pseudonym, but Innes had responded, asking for more information which included her real name and other personal information. The 50-year-old woman, Wendy Lynn Ween, said that she needed a highly skilled field operative to help her with an issue regarding her ex-husband. She wanted him dead. Innes forwarded the information to the Michigan State Police, who took over communication with Ween. Rentahitman.com had been established in 2005. The undercover detective set up two meetings with Ween. At the first meeting, she provided the officer with her ex-husband's home address, place of employment, and work schedule. She had also agreed to pay the service fee of $5,000. During an audio recording that was submitted to the court as evidence of their meeting, one can hear Ween state, I want him gone. She also stated she hoped this site was legitimate because she didn't want to go to jail. At the second meeting, Ween gave the officer a deposit of $200, after which the officer had been able to arrest her. Ween was charged with solicitation for murder and using a computer to commit a crime. She had allegedly wanted her ex-husband dead due to inappropriate behavior. Ween pleaded guilty and said that she had been going through a lot at the time when she had sought out a hitman saying to the courts, At the time, I was going through so much I couldn't catch my breath. If I could go back and change that day, I would. I can assure you of this. While I'm away from home, I'm doing all the therapy and programs I can. The judge on the case, Judge Daniel White, said before he made his sentencing decision, If the intent wasn't so serious here, this would almost be comical, but it's not. Had Ween been successful in her attempts to have her ex-husband killed, it could have been an entirely different trial. He also said, Nobody looking at it could have believed this website was real, but you did. And this didn't pop up on your Facebook feed. You went looking for it. Ween apologized to her friends and family, saying, I take full responsibility for my actions, and I hope a lesson is learned by my example. She reportedly said, I had no right to lash out at anyone, and in a matter of minutes, I changed everyone's lives. I come from a small town where everyone knows everybody. I've humiliated my family doing this. I'm not making excuses for myself. I simply wanted to let you know where my head was. She also apologized to her ex-husband, who is watching the court proceedings virtually. Wayne was sentenced to 24 years in prison. She was credited for 545 days already served and is set for release in 2044. She will be released when she is 74 if she serves her full sentence. Valerie Cincinnelli. It was 2012 when Isaiah Carvalho Jr. got a message and a friend request on Facebook from an attractive woman. Her name was Valerie Cincinnelli, and she said she had seen his photo in his dad's office and asked about Isaiah and thought she might shoot her shot. Isaiah said the couple met and immediately began dating. Isaiah said that when they started dating, everything had been perfect. 
He knew instantly that she was the one for him. He described her as a fun-loving person, devoted to her career, and also was a great mom. Valerie had a young daughter, and Isaiah wanted to spend the rest of his life with this little family. Valerie had worked for the NYPD for nearly a decade when they met, and he loved that about her. He felt that made her a good person because she had dedicated her career to helping others. After the two got married, things started to change between him and Valerie. He said that the sweet, caring, and loving woman he had met had slowly disappeared. He said that she became someone who was cruel, selfish, and grew more and more physically and emotionally abusive. The relationship did a turn. Very distant. It was a very hard, hard experience. When Valerie became pregnant, he said that things took a turn for the worse. He said that they had tried to work on things for the sake of their child, but it wasn't working. He discovered that Valerie had been cheating on him, which solidified the marriage was over. In 2017, they started a long and bitter divorce, which included custody of their son. Isaiah wanted to split custody. The divorce was nearing an end when suddenly Isaiah was approached by the FBI. He couldn't believe what they had told him. They stated, We don't know how to tell you this, but your wife has put a hit out on you. They revealed that it had been Valerie's new boyfriend, John DeRubba, that had reported Valerie's intentions to the FBI. DeRubba had met Valerie while she had still been married to Isaiah. He said that while Valerie had been on patrol, she saw him while he was washing his car and said hi. The two spoke for a few minutes, and DeRubba asked if she was married. She said that she was, but her patrol partner leaned over and yelled, not happily. He said the two added each other on Instagram and began messaging each other. Uh, She came by in a patrol car. And as she came by with the patrol car, she slowed down, said hello, and I said hello to her, and we started chit-chatting. And um, then I was joking around. I said, are you single? And she says, no, I'm not single. And then the partner leaned over and he says, uh, well, she's not happily married. Eventually, they began dating while Valerie finalized the separation with Isaiah. Daruba was 50 years old when he and Valerie met. She was 20 years younger, but he described it as love at first sight. They even got matching tattoos. Daruba described their relationship as rocky, but it was often blamed on stress from Valerie's divorce. He noticed that Valerie had begun to get increasingly paranoid that Isaiah was going to get a portion of her pension. She started talking about needing Isaiah to disappear. Then. Daruba began to notice a more concerning trend. Valerie began to get increasingly jealous about his relationship with his teenage daughter. Valerie didn't want him spending time or money with her, as she viewed it as time and money that could be spent on her and her children. She had even asked, more than once, to stop seeing his daughter altogether. It was in February 2019 when Valerie approached him with a plan for them to spend more time together. She wanted DeRubba to arrange for her ex-husband to be killed, and also his 14-year-old daughter. DeRubba said that he agreed because he was scared and said he knew a guy who knew a guy who could get it done. Instead of calling his friend of a friend, he called the FBI. DeRubba wore a wire, as well as provided text messages showing what Valerie wanted. He had thought that the hitman should take Isaiah to a rough neighborhood to avoid any connection. As for the girl, she wanted her run over and made to look like a hit-and-run. Under the instruction of the FBI, Daruba informed Valerie that he had secured a guy who had accepted the contract. He said that the guy needed $7,000 and it needed to be converted to gold to be clean. Valerie got the cash and gave it to Daruba, who was to convert the money to gold. The FBI enlisted Isaiah's help to aid them in their investigation. They didn't feel they had enough evidence to tie Valerie to the statements, so they wanted to stage Isaiah's death to try and get incriminating statements out of Valerie. He cooperated, and the FBI staged it to look like Isaiah had been shot while in his car. Photos were taken and sent to DeRubba as proof the first murder had been carried out, and then agents went to Valerie's home on Long Island to give her the news that her husband had been murdered. They arrived at her apartment and delivered the news, Daruba had been with her at the time, wearing a wire. When the agents left, 
Valerie immediately began to discuss the alibis and what they should say if they got brought in for questioning about Isaiah's murder. She also instructed him to delete all of their text messages from their phones, saying that it was possible that law enforcement may subpoena their cell phones for investigation. The elaborate sting operation had taken weeks to conclude, but finally, they had enough evidence to arrest Valerie Cincinnelli. In May 2019, she was arrested and charged with two counts of soliciting murder, obstruction of justice, and was held without bail while she awaited trial. Following her arrest, she was also suspended from the NYPD without pay, and she was later terminated. I'll be acquitted because I did not do this. Isaiah is just concerned about his son, and he's just very thankful, as always, to law enforcement. They've been wonderful with him, protecting him. Initially, she claimed she was innocent, but the evidence against her was damning. The audio and video recordings of Cincinnati discussing the murders are extremely strong evidence of her intent to have them killed, federal prosecutors said of the ex-officer. Her ex-husband wanted her sentenced to the highest sentence available and asked the judge to give the maximum sentence, arguing that his ex-wife is a narcissistic sociopath and a master manipulator. She later agreed to a plea deal that would drop the two charges of solicitation to commit murder if she pleaded guilty to the charge of obstruction of justice. This charge carried a maximum of five years as opposed to the 20 she had previously faced. The plea was granted and a judge sentenced her to 48 months in prison. When I found out about the plea, I was furious. I thought she was being given a free pass. I truly believe she will find someone to finish the job when she gets out. Carvalho told the court. With good behavior, Cincinnati could serve less than half of her sentence and be out at any time. Isaiah Carvalho is fearful for what the future holds. He currently has sole custody of his son. His lawyer said on his behalf, not a day goes by that my client doesn't look over his shoulder, adding, Mrs. Cincinnati had tried to hire a hitman once and is fully capable of doing so in the future. Well, that is it for this video. Please let me know if you want me to cover more missing persons cases, as I found this super interesting to research. As always, please give this video a thumbs up if you liked the content, and subscribe for more if you haven't already. Also, don't forget to turn on that notification bell so you get notified when I post. If you have done all that, and want to support me and the channel, we have channel membership and Patreon to get early access, members-only content, live streams, and more. We also have merch and other goodies in the description box, and links to all my socials. But until then, I will see you all in the next one. Bye for now.